back out. Um, first of all, welcome. Um, what I'm going to do here is just share the screen. We've got an agenda. We've got a number of slides here. We're just going to work through. Uh, Nick, Jeff, and I are on the line here, so we'll just kind of jump in as we need to. Um, I believe this is the correct one. Hopefully, I've got the right one. But um, let's see if we can put this in slideshow format from the beginning. That's happening. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I don't know if that's coming through for everyone. Hopefully it is. Um, but the agenda, uh, we'll talk about a progress report, schedule of events for yeah. the rest of yeah. the year, um, expectations of the next step, which is U11 Classic 9v9 Soccer, what's going on in the summer, and uh, the two year plan, looking at our current. U11s and U12s are 9v9 programs um, to try and lead us um, into the future. We'll talk a little bit about, about tryouts and then we'll wrap it up. Um, jumping to the next slide, I'm going to give it over to Nick here and let him kind of run with it. You there, Nick? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me, Eric? Yep. Recording. Um, all right. All right. All right. If we there, there we go. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so just kick it off with the progress report, and then I'll hand it back to this U10 group uh, the most uh, last season and then the beginning of this season. So I think it's only fair that I speak on this. Um, after, I will let Eric and Jeff chime in. But we have uh, two categories here. <clears throat> uh, positives across the board I'm going to start with. I'll leave it off uh, with areas of growth because I think we'll we have you know the rest of the spring to work on that top category. So um, just to remind everybody, we have around forty in the U10 um, age group for just boys alone, which may be our biggest um, age group uh, since we've had youth academy. I don't know, uh, Jeff. Uh, it's a pretty big group. Out of that forty, maybe ten to twelve uh, re returned from last. Um, academy where we only had two teams so uh, all that to say is a huge um, new group of players most of them came from recreational um, and some maybe haven't played at all um, all that to say is they've come a long way in these three categories below um, competitiveness which seems to uh, be year after year something that's um, I guess woven into kind of wax all culture is just that grit to um, no matter how good the other team is, we're going to win, win tackles 90% of the time and just put it uh, put the work in. Um, uniformity, this is something I think that comes along with Youth Academy and is a major difference between the um, the rec side of things. And I'm talking about a structured warm-up, um, just the cohesiveness of the team. Um, kids, when they show up to the session, they know uh, at the start of warm-up, you know, we only have an hour and 15 minutes and it's, and it's go, go, go. Um, and then the last bit is probably the most soccer specific is uh, shape and uh, positional awareness. And what I mean by this is a, a lot of the, a good portion of those players that weren't, uh, that didn't return into the youth academy. It was a lot of, um, hey, this is the shape we're going to play. Uh, this is how you play with, you know, seven on the field. And uh, many of them have a, a great idea and understanding of different, um, different uh, positions. Um, throughout that, you know, 77. So uh, we've made huge strides in all of these three buckets and, um, and uh, just across the board of all four teams or four groups. Um, areas of growth. Um, so this is what, you know, will get us to the next layer uh, uh, in, as a player and as an academy, youth academy, and what we would expect moving into U11 as well, right? So uh, movement off the ball, just one of those tactical ideas. Um, Counterattack transitions. Uh, and that's from, you know, defense to offense and also offense to defense and, uh, and the, the many different areas you win the ball. We, uh, my group, is spe uh, specifically this weekend, we talked about that, you know, once you lose the ball, can we get everybody back behind it? Um, that Just that mentality. Uh, and then on the flip side, that, that excitement to go forward, right, when you win the ball. It's not just one or two players that you guys will sometimes see. Um, and then everybody else is, you know, having a picnic in the back. It's can we all support it? Um, 
general possession and composure on the ball, can we start to string 10, 15, 20 passes together as a a team? Uh, Is he? And then then we can mute whoever's not on mute. Uh, And then individual technique. Uh, This is a huge one, and uh, we have many conversations, Eric, uh, Jeff, and I. And one statement I'll make about this, this is ever-evolving, right? But we can tell, and I, I think there's a correlation year over year over year is those we only have an hour and 15 minutes two times a week and so those players that uh take what we we pour into them that hour and 15 minutes into um whether it's uh, futsal uh, other days of the week or private lessons or if it's just in the backyard because a lot of this stuff they can do on their own those players uh, we see the most growth in uh, over this uh, youth academy. So it's it's not only um, those you know those two two days a week. We really want the this uh, this youth academy I, this ideal youth academy player to take what they uh, what the coaching staff has provided and then go away and double down on it, triple down on it, um, and then uh, vice versa. Right? We can see those players that don't touch the ball um, aside from two hours they're with us. Uh, those ones may be, you know, uh, the most area uh, for growth in, in this specific category. So uh, super excited. We're, uh, we're only halfway done, you know, um, or, you know, a couple games into a spring, I guess. But uh, so a lot to work on and finish out. And what I tell the boys all the time, we, kinda, we start from down here and we want just positive, positive, positive and end on the highest note. We don't want to, you know, this this hill of um, ups and downs, ups and downs of improvement. But um. Yeah, those are my thoughts on just over general U10 progress report. I don't know, Eric or Jeff, if um, if you guys have comments on um, on what you've seen here and there from games, but uh... yeah, I, I think just piggybacking off you there, Nick. I mean, it, it's the same. It's the same everywhere. Um, obviously, the nothing anybody wants to be good at comes easily, and nothing comes overnight. So hopefully, um, you know, we can continue to get players to the U10 level that are really bought into what we're trying to do. And then uh, as we'll talk about in the later on in this presentation of, of where we're trying to go with this thing. Um, uh, and I, I think you've done a great job with your group, Nick, and, and hopefully the U10s are in a good position to transition into U11. Um, what I'd like to do next is, is go to the next slide and turn it over to Jeff. Next slide is obviously what's coming up in a month's time. Um, and that's tryouts. So, Jeff, you on? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Ken. Awesome. I'll let you take it from here. Go ahead. Okay. This this is this is worth a screenshot or maybe even if th- this is going to be sent out to you relatively soon. But the rising U11 boys and girls tryouts are on Monday and Wednesday at Nesbitt. Okay. Um, you'll get an indication of of the the times that those will be held. I think the boys go first at five thirty, and the girls are at at seven. Um, but uh, Eric, if you want to go one step further, but May sixth and, and May eighth, it seems like we've got a couple of months to prepare. But that's going to come pretty quickly. Um, just in a uh, tryouts so in in the academy evaluation or assessment system, we don't call them tryouts. The U eleven when it once we start with nine v nine, and once we start with classic and travel and divisional play where scores count and records are kept track and published on uh, the NCYSA website, um, we, we have an official tryout. And um, while not everybody who comes out for an academy evaluation makes an academy team, the same is definitely true for tryouts. Um, questions are what it's like. There's a registration fee. Um, it's minimal. It goes to a registration t-shirt. Um, ours is um, kind of in, on par with Waxhaw's tuition. It's our our uh, registration fee. I believe is twenty five dollars. I think you'll find local clubs fifty dollars. That's non refundable, and you basically just pay that registration fee. Um, we there are two opportunities to try out plus a third supplemental. And supplementals usually we capture people who have not been at either of the two tryouts, and then they they, they decide that they want to come to a third. Um, there are always two opportunities, but the, some questions that we usually get are, do we need to attend these? Especially if you come from our club, if you come from our club and we know who you are, um, 
Nick, Isaiah, Mike, Isaiah, Elias, Eric, the entire staff of U10 Academy will be at those tryouts. And so we do know the ins and outs of who you are. Do you still need to attend? Yes, we still do like for you to attend because we want to know what the ultimately what the landscape looks like and how your kid fits into that landscape. So yes, we do require that you that you attend one of those at the minimum, but we like two. Um, two because it gives, just gives us a better idea of what the landscape is. And then people who are new to our club come in and they also want to see what the, what it looks like and what it feels like. And we think that our academy players who are graduating, they 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 are part of that portrayal of what it looks like or what it's going to look like. Um, so that kind of goes down to what's it like everywhere else. And I think that that kind of depends on the club. Um, for us, if our players and if our players are attending our tryouts and then we have maybe uh, 25% of the total amount of people who are trying out come from other places, you will largely, your, 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 uh, your player is going to feel more comfortable. They will know the majority of the people there. Um, uh, they are familiar with the territory. They are familiar with the coaches. And so it should feel comfortable. Um, if you go to a tryout where there are 100 players, you may be kind of asked, because you're new, you will be given a t-shirt that says that you're new. And you, <laughs> and you certainly, everyone will know that you're new. You'll be kind of quarantined into an area and you'll have your assessment there. Um, and so sometimes that can be intimidating. It's not a bad thing, but it's just a little bit different. Um, Waxhaw just has all of its players um, attending with the same uniform, the same tryout uniform. Um, you want to go one step further, Eric? Yeah. There we go. And I think, Eric, it's, it's okay for me to continue? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. Um, this has to do with, I think a lot of people, they want to know, well, what's what's the U11 and U12 look like at Waxhaw? And I think that we have, um, uh, uh, obviously, a 9v9 is uh, U11 and U12. And it's important to know at least how things are going right now. Um, it, first of all, to, just to kind of start off, I will tell you that um, uh, Tyler who has been our U11 and U12 director this year, who has coached the U11 boys and girls Navy teams, which is considered maybe more of our top, top tier team. Um, he has moved back to his hometown of Virginia. And so we have uh, two academy coaches or coaches um, who are currently coaching an academy also now stepping in to coach those teams. Um, so th there's a little bit of a change. If Tyler is part of the, the the story of a year for the u11s um the the story has a, a an additional chapter and that means that our director of u11 u12 has been vacated we have already made a hire um i am i am i'm very confident about this particular hire because uh our our candidate and new hire has been with us in in multiple capacities for a good six years i would say um, and also we have a personal history dating back to when Nick was a high school player of mine. But Nick Barnhorst is going to be next year's U11 and U12 director of coaching. He will also be a coach in the U11 boys group. Um, so we're we're really excited and we're really happy. Nick also has a specific expertise and passion for this age group. And he's he and I have both coached in U11 and U12 together. So we're excited about Nick taking over. Currently... Our U11 girls, we have two groups, a Navy and a White. Our, our current group uh, of Navy is in the second division, but because they're, they are, they are um, performing well and the results might support an, um, an increase in division, they will probably be promoted to the first division next year. There is one player currently in the, the Olympic Developmental Program pool in the U11 Navy, in the picture, she's number 27. Yes. We have, yeah. Oh, thought that was a question. Uh, North Carolina, we, we, we have uh, one team participating in Division Three. They'll likely stay in Division Three. I think that suits their team, not just by results, but also we just want to make sure that we properly place these so that they can have competitive matchups. 
So our 11 girls are, we have one that's probably going to be promoted to the first division, which we like, um, and then one that'll stay the same. Our U11 boys currently are, um, we, we don't know. They, they, they started the spring in division two. We put them in division three to see if we would see what the competitiveness looked like. And they may be promoted to division two. They just, they, they had a, a very, a, like a dominate, a dominant win today. And so if this, the, if the trend continues, they'll probably be promoted to the second division. Um, there is, uh, Eric, if you want to go one more slide further, there is a, a difference. And I do, I do want to make sure that we understand what that difference looks like. There's a difference between how our U12s look and how our U11s look. The U11s are, you might be most closely interested in how the U11s are performing because it's one step ahead of you. The U12s are two steps ahead of you. And it seems like those boys were just in academy, but they've been out for a while. Where are our U12 teams? We also have three teams at U12. Our U12 girls are not playing in their, their true division. Uh, they are playing in the U13 division. So they're playing a year up. They won the U13 third division. We promoted them to the, the U13 second division to get them better competition, even though they're still a year up. And they are one loss, one tie early on in the season. And they also have one player in the Olympic developmental pool. Our U12 boys top team, Navy division, yeah. uh, they are not getting good competition in, in division one, which is the top level of play. Um, we were concerned about them. We wanted to maybe explore the option of playing them one year up as well in the U13 division. Um, but we decided based on numbers that they should stay in their own age group. They are easily winning that division. Almost 50% of the team is still in the Olympic developmental pool playing for North Carolina against other states. And one of those players is in the third round of the Charlotte FC club selection, which if you kind of take a look at it from percentages to say that Waxall has a player at Charlotte FC currently competing and moving on, what does that actually mean? One thing that I can tell you is, is that our U-12s are an example of players that have explored tryouts at other clubs, but they have declined any of those opportunities regardless. They have prioritized staying together as a group, and Waxall believes that if players and teams stay together as groups, we can have the, we can have the biggest impact. They can have the biggest impact, and they can, they can carry on what we think is a Waxall identity. If those players stay together, I am not suggesting that they'll be, they'll become uh, Charlotte FC Club Academy players, that they'll become the Olympic developmental pool players. Um, it's rare that that many players from teams actually are still participating at the Olympic hey. developmental level. But what I can tell you Hi. is, you is if those players yeah. stay together and they have that kind it? of dedication, our about. U12s is a model of what we where we want to be as a club. Our U11s are different because they had players that went uh, shopping in clubs. And so coming out of academy, there were players from different academy teams that came together. And so we love the U12 model. We don't mind any model. We just want to coach kids. But we th there is a difference between those two groups. What we would like for our U10s is to follow the model of the U12s. We would like them to stay together. Ultimately, we want you all to make decisions that are best for your kid. But we think that we have better success if we can train teams and we can train individuals to develop within those teams. OK, and obviously I can spend more time talking about it. I'd love to talk about it, um, but I want to make sure that we kind of keep on to an agenda. So if you want to talk a little bit more about that, reach out to me. Um, piggybacking. Thank you, Jeff. Piggybacking on that, um, just kind of a pictograph here. Um, there are lots of options out there. Um, uh, for some, these, uh, these icons may look familiar for others. It may not. Um, we are currently in the North Carolina youth soccer, youth soccer. um, uh, level of play or not level of play, but, um, uh, that's our sanctioning. Um, there's a, there's, you've probably heard of ECNL. If you haven't, it's, it's kind of what everybody considers to be the creme de la creme in terms of, you know, the top talent in youth soccer across, uh, across the country competes in, um, you know, that's where everybody seems to be attracted. Is it the best 
it, it really depends on what part of the country you're in and, and what the specific age group looks like. We can talk about that further. Um, the Waxhaw pathway, just talking about, uh, you know, okay, we're getting to that age where they're coming out of youth academy, they're going into 9v9, so they're going from 77 to 9v9, and and now you're, you're shifting out of a, an academy type setup and now into more of a classic uh, setup within NCYSA, and now we're, we're getting to the point on this pictograph the, of where the road might split um uh within a club um here at waxall it's it's basically if you're going to move into the classic direction you're going to come to the right and you're going to move into the different age age groups within classic um uh jeff anything to add there i know i'm kind of skimming through this quickly i'm looking at a clock but um oh, go yeah, ahead. i hear you Go ahead. No, I I won't. I probably will add something at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, Jeff, in terms of the hundred dollar, hundred fifty dollar commitment fee. Um, there's a preseason camp in in August. Uh, you're going to go to at least a tournament in the fall, tournament in the spring, if not two, depending on what level you are. Um, tuition, you can see that for the teams. Um, there's uniform expense that's in that. We're on a, a cycle. What year are we? One or two in that cycle? This is the uh, a new cycle begins fall of 2024, and so you'll you'll we have a new uniform kit, and that kit will be good for three years. There you go. Um, as Jeff was referring to, looking at the, the the players and judging the level will determine what level or what league they enter into. Um, we want to be smart there. Yes, we want to give them games. Uh, good, good quality games um, and picking that right division depends on what we see in terms of the quality of the players scattered throughout the team. And then there's obviously, obviously optional technical training as we do in the youth academy on Monday nights. Um, that continues. Uh, anything before I jump on? Jump it. Okay. Um, uh, soccer FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, this is a conversation we get in all of the time. Um, it, 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 I've been at a number of different places here and around the city and outside the city in terms of clubs and setups, um, uh, other spots around the country. It doesn't seem to be any different anywhere else in the country that I've been than it is here in, in Charlotte. But um, what, what typically happens is uh, you, you look at your child, you say, hey, my child's got a little bit of ability in, in, in my eyes. And if I've if I want to explore and give my child the best opportunity possible, um, most likely I have to look outside of Waxall, right? Because those are the bigger programs. Those are the big fish in the market. Uh, and we've got to get in there sooner than later, or we're going to miss out and we're not going to have an opportunity. As Jeff was referring to, um, soccer development happens everywhere. Um, and so many people feel like the grass is greener somewhere else until they actually get in their yard and see that it might not be as green as they thought it might have been before getting there. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it's a situation where there's so many moving parts um, uh, to every training environment, to every club, to every uh, age group. Um, but a lot of times, as I've uh, uh, suggested in a number of conversations I've had with folks, is it, it comes down to the, 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 the comfortableness you have with your coach, right? We, we don't have to make worldies. We don't have to make the, uh, the professional team at uh, under 11 or under 12. Um, we need to have a good group of players who like their coach, who are having fun playing together, who are playing at a decent level, competing uh, in competitive environments week in and week out. That's what it's all about. Um, if we're going to do anything more here at Waxall, quite honestly, we need to have players here that uh, have played together and can continue to follow the model of, say, our U12 boys or U11 girls, right? It, 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 that's what we need, um, but we're never going to – beg anyone to stay here at Waxall. If you feel you got to go, go. Um, we would just hope that you would be uh, 
uh, smart enough as leaders to um, do it the right way, ask the right question, ask the right quantity of questions, um, the right quality of questions, um, and put a lot of thought into the decision. Um, I'll jump off the soapbox there. Anything you want to add there, Jeff, Nick, anything? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. It, it, it's kind of simple. Um, it, you, you've just kind of listened to a conversation with the CSA director because that's where Eric was last year. Why did he come here? Um, you know, I think Eric can be really open about that. Um, the conversation with an ECRL dad is basically I've, um, the one that I had yesterday with uh, a, a guy who I played collegiately with. His daughter is playing. Um, well, just it doesn't really matter uh, the club, but he's she's playing ECR, ECRL and they were in the car going to Raleigh. And I just I just, he, you know, I, I had a conversation with him and he said, Jeff, I I need to get out of this. I just don't know how. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I wish there was something different, but I don't know what makes this different or innovative or exciting. I just, I'm just in it. I feel stuck. He's playing ECRL, which is one step, uh, one step down from ECNL. Um, and his daughter's in the car listening to that conversation. She still has to play really hard. Um, I think when it comes to Waxog, where we are going to draw our line is that we want this to be family and friend oriented. We want to emphasize coach and team. Nothing matters more than coach and team, in our opinion. And so I think that if you if you focus on those two things, I think that the answer should be relatively clear. When you feel like there's something else out there, one thing that that, that Eric said is ask the right questions, but trust people who have been at those places and who have 20, 25 years of experience, either playing for those clubs or for just being in this area, ask. Because I will straight up tell you that you cannot stay at Waxo anymore because you need to go somewhere else. I've done it all the time. But we'll be honest because we want to make sure that we want to do what's best for your son or your daughter. We will all, I will always answer the right question. Eric will, Nick will, any of these coaches will. It's not a pride thing necessarily. It's doing what's best for kids. I think that that is a wax all tready to be honest about that. And so I think moving forward, if you have those questions, please make sure that you ask them and let us help contribute to the decision-making. Yeah. Um, I, I, and honestly, if, if you have, specific questions, uh, I would encourage you to reach out, call me, call Jeff, call anyone. Um, love to talk to you, talk you through specific situations that have happened over the years. Uh, maybe it lines up with something uh, that you feel you're exactly in right now. Um, you know, it happens at all ages. Um, we'd like to think that more of those moves uh, work out the way that everybody hopes they will. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times it does not. And you can't really point to one specific thing that happens in the process that makes it uh, puts it a makes it a sour, um, gives it a sour taste in your mouth. Um, but um, that's what we hope to flush out in conversation and hopefully put you at ease before you do make your conversation or make your decision. Um, I think we've pretty much hit it. The only we're kind of at the end of the end of the presentation. Um, we've probably got about eight minutes on the line. While we've got everybody here, does anybody have any specific questions they'd like to ask? If so, unmute yourself, and we'll we'll field as many of those as we can. Hey, uh, Eric and Jeff, it's Rob Olson. Um, from uh, I have two, it's kind of a two part question. One, I'm assuming from a team structure standpoint, as you evaluate all the kids at the tryouts again, they get slotted. Will it be a similar situation from U10 to U11 where you know we've got these groups of teams? Here's one coach, two coach, three coach, where they're broken into uh, a pod, so to speak. You know, a, 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 an A pod, a B pod, C pod, where they all train together, but possibly with a different coach, just like they do now with U10. Rob, that's a good question. The, the structure is is it's considerably different. Basically, what it is is it's one team and one coach. Now there Got could it. be from from scheduling. We like to schedule the teams to train at the same time and generally of the same location in case we want to do any kind of scrimmaging and match preparation. But it really does get to be 
a very independent situation. Academy is always together, um, 40 people on a training field, but th this one might be, um, you know, 11 people on a field with a coach at a designated time, to, uh, uh, minimum twice per week. Uh, oh, so coaching. that could be the instance of Nick coaching one group of U11 boys at right. this time. And then the next hour or after that is group two of said 11. That's boys. right. 100%. Okay. Got it. Got if, it. Okay. That's, that's, that's perfect. If um, no one my... from, if no one from the outside comes to tryouts, our projected numbers are that we're going to have three U11 teams in the boys and one in the girls. Gotcha. No, that's a thank you for answering that because sometimes people are thinking again, everybody at the same time moving around. This is, you know, much more intimate with the same coach, same philosophies across the entire squad, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, and and a big difference there, Rob, sorry to interrupt. The big difference yeah, for yeah. everybody to realize is in the youth academy, um, you're looking at a, a, a pool of 40 players divided amongst 40, uh, four teams. You can take, you know, player 38 and put them with player two if you wanted to on a given weekend and then have player 38 play with players 36 and 35. Um, you, you have the flexibility to move them around as you see fit. It's just a pool. When you get into 9v9 and classic soccer, now you're freezing your rosters. So you announce your rosters and that roster is pretty – now, can you club pass and move a player here and there? Yes, but it's a little bit more of a process on a game day. Referee's going to check rosters. Referee's going to check more than – they would on say a you know a game day like we had yesterday. It's just a little bit more um, formal, I should say, at the next. And level. is that and is that formal process? You kind of brought it up, so I'll just go down that road prior to my other question. But um, is does that roster change possibly weekly? Like you said, there could be movement, or is that for no. No. Uh, fall or for the season? No, you're you're you're. Pretty much, you're, you're going to have a, a very, very similar roster from August to May. To May. Okay, perfect. No, that's good to know. Um, and then my other question is, obviously, you know, Academy, we kind of have a travel radius for games um, in the area. What would be the travel radius approximately for this next level, just for people on the call here? That's a good question. Um, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, radius is kind of like a geometry term. So here's what I can tell you. Um, we typically, we, we play in NCYSA either West 1 or West 2. Most of the participants are Charlotte participants. Um, there are Greensboro participants, Winston-Salem participants, and Asheville participants. There are some participants on the western side of North Carolina that might require a two and a half hour trip. Here's what I can tell you is typically what we do is we say, if we go to you in the fall, then you will come to us in the spring. So that kind of mitigates a lot of the traveling. I, I can just tell you that most of the travel is within 45 minutes, exactly like Academy. And there may be a one-off travel that might take you an hour and a half. You may go to Asheville. When that happens, Rob, I like to schedule the Asheville trip in the fall, right in the mid-October when the leaves are pretty, and then make them yep. come to us in the spring. I know how to do it. I'm an expert. No, that's perfect. Cause it, yeah, just the radius question popped into just popped into my head um, and everything. So I thought that was a good one. Um, we've that's got about from my, we those, got, we got about those are the questions minutes. I have. Two so, minutes. Anybody I'm, else I'm have another question? Yeah, I. This is uh, Michael Goodman here. I have a I have a few questions, if I may. Uh, first one is uh, hopefully very easy to answer. Uh, where are the practices going to be? Is it going to be Nesbit or is it going to be somewhere else? Right now, Nesbitt. Okay. Uh, the second question that I have is, um, is it going to be twice a week or is it going to be more? Okay, good question. There's at least, there's a minimum of two trainings per week. There is an optional technical training, which would be the, the third, but that's optional. If the team is entering the first division, it's a mandatory three trainings per week. That means that the first division teams would train three times per week plus an additional fourth night per week. Um, and then second and third division would have two per week plus the third option. Got it. And then um, since you touched on that division one, 
um, what what is the difference between um, division three, division two, division one, and is when you say division one, how does that compare to um, I guess pre ECNL or you touched on ECRL as well, which is that's a new one for me. Yeah, it's okay. I mean that those are that's kind of U thirteen, um, U thirteen and up. Pre ECNL is just a badge that you put on things. Um, it it just it really just does depend. If you want your pre ECNL group performing at U eleven first division and they end up winning their games by four or five goals each, then it might be good for you to put them one year up. So it just, both of our U12 groups are one year up because they're pl pr playing at a pre-ECNL level. If we wanted to put a badge on them to make them feel better, we would say they're pre-ECNL, but right now they're just playing one year up at that level. So that's that's the answer to the question. There's a significant difference between first and third division. Significant hey. division. We're going to run out of time. When we get cut off, if anybody has any additional questions, email them, call, whatever you feel you need to. We'll try and answer as many as we can, but it will probably disconnect here in seconds. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. We'll keep it going if we need to. Uh, appreciate you checking in. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for everything. Yeah.